How do your siblings feel about your success? <laughs> well, my sisters tortured me a great deal of my life, um, and they would do things. We, we lived in a very rural area, and we only had the bookmobile. And uh, this was like the, the library. And the bus driver for school was also the bookmobile driver. She was an awful woman, and she hated all of us. And she was also a chain smoker. So whenever I smell cigarette smoke, I have this desire to read. Um, <laughs> but when we would hand our books in, she would check every single page. You know, we're standing there, and she's sitting there, we had the steering wheel and she's looking at every page and my sisters would do things like put gum in it or candy or that sort of thing and so it gives me great pleasure that I'm so successful <laughs> because I said it, you did not thwart me um, they would tear up my papers and things they were really awful um, actually I'm, I'm, I'm going to write a book about that one <laughs> my father is so surprised that people pay me to do this um, many people who read my books may feel the same way um, he's very proud of me, but you know, when he was growing up, hard physical labor was how you got paid. Just sitting there, staring off into you know the, the sky and thinking of stories. He thinks that I have like pulled the wool over everybody's eyes. Um, but he's so happy that I won't ever have to move back home again. <laughs> I can see having a sense of humor. Yes. <laughs> well, you should meet my father. Anyone else? Well, since we're here at Mad, uh, if you could tell us just a little bit about your process and how you, you know, how you turned out 13 books in all these years. And how you I have no memory of it. I really don't. Um, and I think if I did, I probably wouldn't do it again every year. Um, basically, you know, Sarah Waters is such a, a fascinating um, person. I love her books, but she said writing is 10 minutes of sheer pleasure when you're thinking, oh, they're going to do this and this and this, you know, and then the rest of it is the, the hard part, you know, the sitting down, figuring out how the pieces go together. And so for me, I keep all of those 10 minutes of pleasure moments. I write them on index cards and I keep them, you know, I don't keep them in one place, which is really stupid. Um, probably bad for when my sister would steal things. Uh, but I, I, you know, will go through them and, and start thinking about stories. And usually when I'm writing a book, I have ideas for the next book. And that's one of the great pleasures, actually, of writing a series. Even with my first book, I knew, if, even if it didn't get published, that it was going to be a series. And so instead of putting all the people I hated in high school in that book, I got to, you know, draw it out to the next ones. And, you know, the first novels tend to be extremely self-indulgent. I probably have some self-indulgence and blindsided, but knowing that some more books were coming, I was able to plant this stuff. And I think of books in terms of threes to fours. And so emotional stuff, um, relationship stuff, where characters are going to be, that all is something that I've got planned out very carefully. As for the crimes or the center of the plots, that's something that I work on uh, more toward the end of the last book because when you get to the last part of the, the book you're working on, the book you really want to work on is the next one, right up until you start working on the next one. Um, and so that's, that's when I really start thinking about what the next book's going to look like, what the plot is, how it's going to start. And generally, when I finish the last book, just to keep the tone in place, I'll write the first chapter of the next book. And even if I'm not completely sure what the plot's going to do. I can always go back and revise. It makes sure that totally it's still in that same place. And a lot of times my first chapters are not about my main characters. There's almost short stories about new characters and, you know, somebody has to die. So it doesn't ruin anything, don't worry. Um, but that's just, I mean, it's, it's kind of higgledy piggledy but I, I, I know so writers who do it so much better so than you're me. more intuitive writer. Absolutely, but every writer is different. Uh, I was just, I was in Albany, I know, right? And um, <laughs> Jennifer Hay, who's a wonderful writer, she wrote a fantastic book called Mrs. Campbell, many more, a short story collection, wonderful writer. Um, she said to me that she writes, she gets up and she writes four hours a day, and I thought, my God, to be able to do that and not do what I do, which is I have a cabin in the North Georgia mountains, and I go out there and I write for two weeks straight, and I'll work 12 to 16 hours a day, and then I'm so exhausted I'm going to kill myself. And I come home and I recuperate, and then I go back up. 
it, it's a really sadomasochistic way to do it, but I've been doing it for this long, so I, maybe I think it's going to ensure that I probably won't write 13 more because I'll be dead. <laughs> yes? Uh, to follow up on that, so if you don't have an idea, 100,000 words, and so many scenes, so that it doesn't go yeah. away. Well, you know what? If, if you are, if you want to be a writer, then you need to train your ear to know when something's too long. And you don't, don't look at a book as in, it has to be this number of pages, it has to be this many scenes, it has to, because that, that's very mechanical, nuts and bolts sorts of things. And, I mean, you can go get Save the Cat and plan out your book that way, um, but is that the kind of book you want to write? And if it is, that's great. Is that going to be a successful book? Probably not, because the thing that people, and I, this sounds so hokey, people see authenticity. They know when you don't believe in what you're doing. Um, you know, Dan Brown, when he wrote The Da Vinci Code, he loved that book, he loved that story, he was really passionate about it. If he had just sat down and said, well, I'm going to write this bestseller, no one would have ever heard of it. So you, I think if you don't have that genuine passion that people see it. I think even um, people writing with James Patterson have a certain passion about what they're doing within that formula. Um, and just on James Patterson, you should all love James Patterson because he makes a ton of money for his publisher. And his publisher might one day give some of that money to you because they have it. One in every 10 books in America that is sold is a James Patterson book. Um, he keeps the economy moving. He keeps that independent bookstore open that one day you hope you're going to be touring at. So, you know, never, even E.L. James, more power to her. Random House has lots of money now. Um, they can pay for promotions. They can get new authors. As a reader, I'm ecstatic because it's new authors that I'm going to love. Um, so you can't, uh, for me, because you may have some idea and some magic formula and you're going to write it and it's going to be spectacular uh, and, you know, you're going to go ha-ha to me. But uh, my opinion is you have to feel some passion about it. The reason I ask is I, I published three books which were 800 pages and I tried to write <laughs> Well, you know, Diana Gavaldon, I mean, she writes 15,000 page books. In Germany, they have to publish her on uh, Bible pages, seriously. Um, if, you're, if, if the story is there, look at Game of Thrones, if the story is there and the passion is there, a book is as long as it needs to be. Um, uh, something I think is really interesting is um, Gone with the Wind is a really long book for its time. Grapes of Wrath is around 200 pages. Mice and Men, around 200 pages. The Great Gatsby. Um, when people had typewriters and it was this, and I messed up, I have to put a new page in and do it over again, books were a lot shorter. <laughs> um, but, you know, I think that if you, if you read the types of books that you were writing, that you have an ear for how long they need to be. And I always panic around page 100 because I think, oh, is it going to be a novella? And then around page 200, I think, okay, well, it's enough. If it's really, you know, if I got myself into a mess, perhaps my editor has some ideas. And then 300, I'm like, oh, crap, I can't be 400. It can't be more than a ream of paper, you know. Um, but uh, it, it just, they all fall where they need to fall. Yes? Uh, because you write a series, you have a relationship with your characters. You know, you see your communities in next parts. Do you think of the next book as, uh, or all of your books, as I want to talk about this theme, this is the story I want to tell, or is it I want to, I really want to tell this story with Will, or I really want to be with Sarah? Is it, or is it both? Well, I do think of the books in terms of this is more about Will, or Sarah, or Arlena. Um, Criminal, which was a book before Unseen, certainly is more of a Will book. Um, and then people complained that there wasn't enough of Sarah. And then uh, Unseen had more of Sarah, and people complained there wasn't enough of Will. Um, so people complained. That's the take-home message here. Um, but I, I do think of them in that way. But a lot of times, it doesn't happen that way. I'm a big believer in letting the story go where it needs to go. And if I think of something in particular in Unseen, Lena's a character I've written about for many years. She's a very uh, volatile character. A lot of people don't like her, and they, they didn't realize at first that that was okay. I kind of intended that. Um, and usually when someone comes up to me and says, I really like Lena, I make these value judgments about them. Um, 
and nine times out of ten, I'm right. Um, and the people who really hate her, they say, but I, say, well, I want to know what she's going to do next. So I think, well, that's good. Um, I can't remember who who said this. There was a, an interview in the New York Times because there's this, all this thing about likable characters. Now, we know in crime fiction, people have been writing unlikable characters on purpose for years, right? Uh, but that's the literary world has uh, turned from my navel myself to I'm going to write about uh, really unlikable characters, and if you don't like it, that means that you're just not the right reader. Um, and someone was interviewed, I think Curtis Sittenfeld or someone like that, and she said, I think the thing is when a woman writes an unlikable character, people don't realize she does it on purpose. Uh, but men can write unlikable characters. And so I, that was like a light bulb moment for me because with my character Lena, I think in the early days a lot of people didn't understand that I knew that she was unlikable. Um, and that that was for a reason, and that there were plenty of other people to like in a book. And I, you know, I think that the balance is what's important, because people who don't like Lena have read all six of my books that feature her, and they have strong opinions about her, but there were other people and other things going on so that that balanced it out. And achieving that balance is really important. I write fairly graphic scenes, and I make sure when I have something awful happen that I balance it uh, within the next chapter or next couple of chapters with something that gives the reader some kind of relief. Um, because you just can't have unrelenting, horrible stuff happen all the time. Uh, as my grandmother said, you can't fall off the floor. Uh, at some point, you have to get up. And, you know, I, I think in many ways that my books are kind of funny. No one else agrees with me. Um, and I think that I always try to end on a positive note because when, when people endure, when people go on, when they live to fight another day, to me, that's a happy ending. Um, there, there's a, a wonderful um, book, I can't remember the title, uh, but it was written by Viktor Frankl, it was in the 50s, it was a self-help book, it was how it was built. And this was a man who was an, an Austrian Jewish person who survived the Holocaust. And he was a psychiatrist, and so when he went into the, the concentration camps, he thought, well, this is an opportunity so that I won't go mad to study the people around me. And the question I want to know is why do some people survive and others don't? You know, someone who's sickly and, and in a bad way might survive, but someone who's completely healthy in every regard ends up killing themselves. And what he found out was that the people who survived were people who had plans for later. The artist who wanted to paint the, you know, the, the tableau of this horrible scene the writer who wanted to talk about uh, what had happened there, the essayist who wanted to talk about how it had happened, and Frankel himself who wanted to talk about studying all these different people. And so his conclusion was that the people who survived had meaning in their lives. And I'm a firm believer in meaning. I think you have to have a purpose. And if you don't, that you can never really feel settled. And my meaning in my life is to be a writer and to tell stories. And even if I wasn't published, I wouldn't be as happy, but I would still be telling these stories. I would still be writing. And I think that you can have meaning without happiness, but I don't think you can have happiness without meaning. And so when I'm writing my books, I'm, I'm thinking about that through my characters. You know, how am I going to give Will meaning in this book? What am I going to say about him that's new? Uh, and then also, I'm very conscious that there are people who buy my books at airports and frankly don't give a shit about that. So I've got to make sure the book works on the level for the person who's looking for uh, the sort of emotional stuff and the person who's just reading it for the sex and violence, which is probably the majority of them, um, which I applaud because I love books with sex and violence. Um, you know, you write what you know. <laughs> the research is fantastic. <laughs> Anyone else? Yes. You mentioned that your father was did you tell stories when you were a child? Yeah. Did you take this up in an early I did. I got in trouble all the time in school. I just made stuff up. And, uh, you know, now I, I laugh because I get paid for it. Um, I, but I had a very vivid imagination. I was really quiet, um, believe it or not. I always sat in the back of the class, and I was always writing stories. And, um, it, it, you know, everybody who knows me from that time in my life will tell you that I was always head down working on something. Yes? Um, in some ways, it seems to me, maybe because I'm meeting so many 
crime fiction writers, but it seems to me in a way we're in a golden age for crime fiction. And I wonder what you think about the colleagues in the environment for crime fiction now. I think that for men it's always been the golden age of crime fiction. I think what we're saying is that finally women are in a part of it. When I first started writing, um, I every interview I did was, gosh, your books are so violent. Or why are you writing about such strong women? And I would think, nobody's asking Lee Child why, he, why he's writing about strong men. Um, and it was, it was really hard not to get a chip on my shoulder about it. And women were the worst, as always, you know. When, when, uh, <laughs> oh, especially when a woman succeeds, there's always going to be a woman who's pissed off about it. Um, and they would say to me, well, you can't be a feminist and write about that. And I would say, well, you can't be a feminist and tell me what I get to write about. Um, and uh, I, I took a lot of crap for it. But I was writing the books I wanted to write. I thought I was writing in a responsible way. I never got any credit for all the men I killed or victimized. Um, I had a guy raped and nobody was like, hey, parody. Um, so, you know, and I, I do try to keep that balance. And I do try to keep it in the realm of reality, too. Um, and, and a couple of times, I've actually had victims who survive. And to me, that's the hardest thing to write about. It's very easy to write about a victim who passes away. Um, the thing about murder is it suddenly makes you a lot more interesting than you used to be, uh, especially in fiction. But you know, there are pe people we would never have heard about in the national news and had they not been murdered. You know, People living their everyday lives, and then suddenly, they, they're killed in a really spectacular way, and we wanted to do that with them. Um, and so, you know, I, I feel like now with me, Kathy Rice, Ted Skerritsen, Mo Hader, Denise Mina, um, Tana French, Ala Fair, of course, Lisa Unger, um, now it's acceptable for us to write books that are not like loner books, like Kenzie Milhelm or Sarah Goretzky, which I grew up on. But I think that there's a reason why they weren't in relationships, because they couldn't be tough and still be in relationships, really. Uh, and now women can be in relationships. They can enjoy sex, which before if they enjoyed sex, they had to be killed. Um, you know. And if they're um, sexually assaulted, they're not going to wait for some guy to come and make love to them and make everything all right. You know, I mean, it's just it's a different way of looking at it. And I'm, so I really feel it's a wonderful time for us. And, we have so many fantastic writers right now, um, but they're just, they're picking up on the, what we're seeing, I think, a little bit of in society. I mean, there's still a lot of the patriarchy and all that, but I also think men are benefiting from it because it's no longer acceptable for them to write about the really tough guy who always saves the woman. And one of the best writers, I think, who is the most feminist, wonderful writer of women is Lee Child. Reacher doesn't meet women who are frail and weak. It meets women who go shoulder to shoulder with him. Um, and, you know, it's not a um, Stone Barrington situation where every woman he meets, whether she's five or 500, wants to give him a blowjob. Um, you know, it's really, he's a tough guy, and, but he can be around tough women and he can still be tough. So I love that kind of thing. So, yes. Um, talk a little bit about balance with uh, regard to writing and thoughts and, uh, and ideas off of people. And writing is very solitary. So do you have uh, or participate in a writing group? Or? Never. I haven't. Um, and I, I guess I'm too arrogant, but I haven't, I've had the same editor um, since my second book in England, um, who's worked with me um, and isn't afraid to tell me when something's really awful. and who stands up to me and who really understands story. And then I have a, an editor in the US who once my UK editor and I get to the point where we can't even see the words anymore, she steps in and she's like, oh, well, this is it, and this is it. And we're like, oh, OK, well, we're stupid. Thank you. Um, so I think it's important to choose someone you believe will be honest with you to, to critique your work. I'm not a fan of showing a lot of people uh, because everybody's going to have a different opinion. That's going to get inside your head. Or, or I should say my head. It, it, this is me specifically. Because I know there are writers who workshop and get great benefit from that. And you know, when I was first starting out, I had a friend of mine who had 11 million English degrees and all this stuff. And 
was very kind to donate her time and read my work and give me honest critique. That's the thing that, whether it's from one person or a hundred people, you need that honest critique and you need to not think that they are idiots, uh, which is really hard, and to really take it on board. You know, my first book that was shopped out um, was historical fiction and nobody wanted to publish it. And I asked my agent to send me all the rejection letters from the editors at these houses because I thought this is my opportunity to really hear from New York editors at these houses what they think of my work. And so she, she redacted the names because she didn't want me to call them. Um, and uh, then she went on vacation and she sent me the letters. And I was really pissed off for a couple of days. You know, those stupid Yankees. Uh, and then I thought, wait a minute. So what they're saying is they don't like the story, but they like the characters. And they really like my writing. And they want to see more. And so that's when I sat down and I talked to my agent. And she said, yeah, you know, what do you want to do now? And I said, I, I always wanted to write a crime novel. I didn't think I had it in me. Um, some may agree. Uh, and so she said, well, write it, and if it's bad, don't show it to me, just good, show it to me. And so I sat down, and, and over the course of 17 days, I wrote Blindsided, the bones of it, my first book. And, you know, then I, I let it sit and simmer a while, and then I went back. And over about six, the course of six months, I got it to where I thought it was really good, and I sent it to her. And because I hadn't sold anything to her, she took a really long time to read it. And while she was doing that, I wrote my second book. And uh, she called me and she said, um, I think I could sell this. And I said, well, you're going to have to get a two-book deal because I've written a, a, a sequel. And she said, okay, uh, well, send me that. And she read it a little more quickly and she called and she said, I think I can get you a two-book deal. And I said, well, um, I'm halfway through the next one. I'm going to need a three-book deal. And she said, okay, stop writing. <laughs> But it took 10 years to get there, and it took really being brutal about my work. You have to be brutal about it. You have to, when you write it, it's wonderful, but then the thing that makes you a good writer is you have to go back and say, this doesn't belong. Um, one of the things I'm really sensitive to is a lover of sex and violence. Is For me, there's always a test. Okay, if I have this, this violent act or I have this sex scene, if I take that out of the book, does the book still make sense? Then it doesn't belong in there. And that's really hard to do, but you have to do that. Because, you know, your mom reading your book is really patient. Somebody who's bought it, even if they bought it for $1.99 on Amazon, they're going to get really pissed off if you've left that in and it doesn't belong. One last question. Oh. <laughs> it seems that you have a, a real affection for your characters, and I think that really first to the reader, but do you ever wish you could abandon them and write other ones or do you they ever stump you? Um I think that every character has its own life and um, when I was writing my Grant County books about book four I thought, wow, am I gonna be writing Grant County and um, I'm ninety years old and you know they're taking out their teeth and uh, <laughs> saying, uh, well I'll go to bed and solve this crime tomorrow when they let me out of the nursing home. Um, and so I chose to kill off a major character. It was very difficult to, to do. People were furious at me. Um, I got death threats uh, in many different languages. I had people who just didn't understand it. There's a, a, a site called Dear Reader, if you want to read people who really hate me. Um, or no, Dear, Dear Author, I'm sorry. And the review is written in the form of a letter to the author. This woman does not like the choice I made. Um, and I think there are 800 posts to agree with her. Uh, that I hate men, that I hate women, that I did it to sell books, that I'm never going to sell another book again, that, you know, this and that. Um, and it was such a private and difficult choice for me, but it, I think it was the right choice because I don't want to write the same book over and over again. I don't want to be bored. I want to be a writer. Uh, I want to improve myself. I want to keep doing good work and feel proud of my body of work. Um, and so I made that decision, and, and I didn't come to it lightly. And you know, now people will come and say, well, I'm still mad at you, but I love the Will Trent books. And I think, well, you're just not much of a friend, are you? <laughs> um, but, it, but I think they see it now, because you don't want to read a book when the writer is bored. We've all read those books where we think, man, this guy just wanted the paycheck, or his deadline must have come up fast. Um, and I don't want to be that writer. I want to be the one who's telling new stories, and. I felt like there needed to be a change. I mean, on a very 
realistic level, I'm writing about small town, right? And there are murders and pedophiles and rapists. I mean, it's like Congress. It's really. <laughs> at some point, you think, why are people living there? <laughs> so I, that, I thought, well, move it to Atlanta, third most violent city in the world. Um, kill a lot of people there. Move, have the Georgia Bureau of Investigation so I can move around the state. I don't have to just stay in Atlanta. And it was, I think, a good way to solve it. And, and it helped the other characters, because Sarah, one of the characters in that book, was very. Um, getting kind of boring to me. And you think you want to re read about happy people, but you really don't. Happy people are so boring. Um, you know, even Mae Benchy knows that. You know, there has to be some kind of conflict. Oh no, they're going to close the park. You know, there has to be something that propels the story. And so that's, that's why I did it. And I think that if, if I had to do it again, I might not do it. I might find another way, because I got, I got a letter from a 90-year-old woman who said, I woke up in bed with my husband of 60 years, and he had passed away, and I didn't want to read about that, another husband dying again, and I was like, oh my God, it stabbed me in the heart. But dear author, you should read that, because this won't really mean people are there. <laughs> and I actually, I contacted the woman who, who wrote it, and I said, look, I want to send you the next book from my copies, not from my publicist. No one needs to know, because I want you to see why I did this. And if you hate it, that's fine. I know you'll post about it if you hate it, you know, but I, I would like to do this. And she said, no, I'll never trust you again. <laughs> yeah. But then she saw me at the Random House open house and wanted her picture with me, so I thought, what's up with her? <laughs> People, right? <laughs> so listen, everyone. Uh, come over here. Buy a book. Get Karen to sign it for you. Support, support authors, booksellers, all the rest, and uh, thank you so much.